Um, this is ISH 507, Applied Time Series Analysis. Hopefully this is where you want to be. Hopefully this is where you'll still wanna be nine weeks from now. Let's put it that way. Um, so today we'll spend a little bit of time uh, with some introductions, get to know one, one another just a little bit. Uh, then we'll talk about just some of the course logistics and then I'll do just a little bit of an introductory lecture. Uh, I don't think there's any chance we'll go longer than an hour, but just for everybody's uh, benefit, this the class is sort of 80 minutes, roughly is the scheduled time. Um, you know, sometimes we might take that whole time, other times we won't. There's certainly, if we don't take all that time with material, the instructors are happy to stay around. Like if you have questions about your homework or later in the quarter, you've got questions about your project, that sort of thing, you wanna chat discuss our wonderful weather we've been having, stuff like that. That's, that's all great. Um, okay, so let's see here. Maybe what I will do is go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Is everybody looking at the course website? Yeah, I see Amelia shaking her head. Okay, that's good. Um, okay, so hopefully you've all had a chance to maybe look at this website. Um, this is going to be your landing page for the next 10 weeks. Um, today, we are going to talk about some overview stuff. So I'm going to show this. Let's make this a little bigger. One more. Okay, so um, by way of introductions, who are we? Well, my name is Mark Shirell. I'm an associate professor in the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences. And I'm also the assistant unit leader for the Washington Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. Um, I am but one of three instructors for this course. The others are Eric Ward, and I'll let Eric introduce himself in a minute. And the other is Eli Holmes, who's not Corinna Zeke and her daughter. <laughs> you, you may, you're clearly logged into Corinna's account or she was using yours, Eli, so that shows you. And you're muted right now. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm Mark. Um, I've been in the school for about a year and a half now. And before that, I worked with uh, Eric and Eli at NOAA Fisheries for about 16 years. Um, and we have taught this class now. This is, I believe, the fifth time. Yes, fifth time we've taught this class. So um, in our opinion, it gets a little bit better each time. So lucky you that you weren't here in 2013 when we taught it for the very first time. So um, anyway, maybe I will, Eric and Eli, do you wanna take just a minute to introduce yourselves? Sure, uh, like Mark said, my name is Eric Ward. I'm a, um, a st quasi statistician at the Northwest Fishery Science Center. Um, I've been there for about uh, 10 years. Um, I've known Mark and Eli longer because uh, I, I did a PhD at SAFS um, with, uh, with Ray Hilborn and, and Andre Punt. Um, and so um, after that, I, I got a job at the Northwest Center and I, um, I, primary, I do a lot of uh, Bayesian modeling with lots of different applications. So um, time series is, is a large part of what I do. Um, also some, uh, some spatial problems and um, lots of stuff related to endangered species work. So salmon and killer whales and things like that. So um, with that, I will pass it to Eli. Uh, hi, I'm Eli Holmes. And um, as um, Mark and Eric mentioned, I've worked with um, both of them for a long time. Um, I am a research scientist and affiliate of faculty at UW. I'm a research scientist at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. And in that capacity, I work on a lot of endangered species issues, but kind of the main thing that I do is time series analysis and helping different groups with um, problems that involve time series analysis. And with um, Mark and Eric and I have done a lot of research on this topic together. And one of the pa our packages that we'll be using is something that the three of us developed over the last uh, 15 years to um, do uh, multivariate time series analysis. So that's one of the things you'll be learning in this class. 
Okay, so let's see. So um, for course format here, um, you probably saw from the, the uh, time schedule that we have basically Tuesday and Thursday afternoons. In general, the, we spend Tuesday and Thursday kind of a lecture time. We have lecture and then we have a dedicated lab time, but you're gonna see that we're gonna be sprinkling lots of kind of lab stuff right into the lectures. Even today, you'll see some R code and that sort of thing. Um, so, but it's really designed to be a hands-on class. So you're gonna learn um, more techniques probably than theory, although we will talk about some of that. But if you want sort of the hardcore statistical underpinnings of this, we can point you to other courses or um, piles of textbooks that would go into that in great detail. The kind of goal here though, is to give you much more of a, a broader uh, kind of approach and exposure to the different methods in time series analysis and the things that you might be able to do moving forward. Um, so in general, we, we really encourage a lot of questions during class. So again, right in a, in a normal classroom setting, we'd be sitting in a classroom and you'd just be able to raise your hands and interrupt. Um, this is Zoom, which is unfortunate, but we still um, invite interaction as much as possible. So we'll try to make use of the chat um, or just you know blurt something out, be like, I'm sorry, stop, stop, stop. I didn't understand what you said, or could you go back? Um, I'll, you know, with the instructors, we'll try to monitor the chat. Uh, if we're not seeing something and you've noticed that your colleague has question has gone unanswered for 10 minutes, feel free to pipe up and say, hey, you haven't answered Marcus's question or whatever the case may be. Um, you should feel free to email either Eric, uh, Eli, or myself with any questions related to the course. And as the course moves on, there's going to be some homework and there's going to be projects and that sort of thing. So again, that correspondence will be important. Um, and in general, we will try our best to respond within 24 hours. And I think we can usually keep that up. But don't feel shy about asking for help. We don't have any dedicated office hours for this class, but if you feel like, you know, I could really just use a little one-on-one -on -one chat, just feel free to reach out to one of us and I'm sure we can find some time to schedule that sort of thing. All right, um, so grading for this class, 30% uh, of your grade is gonna come from weekly homeworks. And those will basically be assigned at the end of class on Thursday, the end of the lab. And they're due essentially at midnight, one week later. And the material for that will come from a combination of lectures and computer labs. None of those homeworks are particularly long and onerous. Um, if you want to work on the homeworks with a lab mate or another friend, that sort of thing, that's fine. But everyone has to turn in their own assignment. Um, and if for whatever reason you have something in your life that comes up, that sort of thing happens more and more these days, you know, just again, reach out to us as soon as possible and say, listen, I'm going to have a hard time getting my homework in next week or whatever the case may be. And, and we'll figure something out for you. Um, a bulk of your grade for this class is going to come from a research project and a paper. So 40% of that is going to be a, a project that you conduct by yourself, an analysis, you're going to write that up. Um, and that's going to be due basically during finals week. And then once we get the papers, everybody turns in their papers, the editors for the class, Eli, Eric, and I will distribute um, in a blind sense, the two papers to each of you, and you will have to provide a peer review of those papers and send those back to us by the 18th. And as the course goes on, we'll help you with what that peer review is supposed to look like. We've got even a template for you to use and that sort of thing and a score sheet. Um, but for those of you who've not been through the peer review process, either as an author or a reviewer, this will be a really good experience for you because this is in fact a big part of the scientific process. And we'll talk a little bit more about projects as the course goes on, certainly. Um, and then roughly 10% of your class is participation, right? We, if you're enrolled in this class, we'd expect you to be here. Um, and, you know, if you can't make things happen again, you know, just let us know. And it's certainly possible you're going to miss a class here or there. You've got a doctor's appointment or something, you know, just again, let us know. It's not a big deal. All of this stuff is going to be recorded. So if you do miss a class, you should be able to go back and watch it. The links will be posted on the website, um, as well as if you want to review past material, you could always go back and look at the, the 
recordings of the lectures. Okay, oops, I got off in there. Okay, so I want to talk about the final project here just a little bit because this is, again, like I said, sort of a bulk of your um, grade for the class. So in general, we're sort of trying to target a sweet spot for this project. We want you to be able to produce something that has meaning. It's not just a one page quick and dirty analysis, sort of like a homework um, project. And if you're really motivated and um, have a data set in hand that works for you, there's a really good chance that you could parlay your class project into a thesis chapter or something. We've had students do that in the past. So it, it may seem like a pipe dream to think, oh my God, 10 weeks from now, I'm actually gonna have this done. It's actually more like about 11 weeks, but anyway, yeah, you will. And um, so we're thinking again on an applied problem. And it could be again, univariate or multivariate. That may not make any sense to you right now, but it will in a few weeks. Um, and we're thinking about sort of short format papers. So if you're, you know, you're familiar with the scientific literature at all, any, the journal Ecology has these reports um, and Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences has rapid communications. But the idea is that we're looking for a maximum of about 20 pages inclusive of your reference tables and figures, right? So we don't want some long 50 page monograph. You don't wanna produce that anyway. So this is gonna work out pretty well for all of us. Um, and then again, by the time the course is done, not only will you get comments back from the instructors, but you're also gonna get two sets of peer reviews from your colleagues in the class. Um, so I know when we were going around, it sounded like a bunch of you actually already had some data sets in mind, either from your own research or maybe your advisor has something that you're interested in. If you don't, here are a bunch of links to data sets that are publicly available, and you could certainly work with any of that information. Um, these are hyperlinks, so if you're playing along at home, you just click on those and it will take you to where those are. Within the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences, the Alaska Salmon Program, I guess we don't have anyone uh, in this quarter who's associated with the program, has a lot of long-term monitoring data. Um, and we could help put you in touch with the PIs with that project. Also, you're gonna see, because we, are, we have many examples in class, that um, there's a very extensive database on the lower trophic levels of Lake Washington, which is just out UW's back door, right? Um, so that's another possibility for you. Um, in addition, it turns out that running concurrently with this course is something called an, the Ecological Forecast Challenge, and that's being sponsored by an NSF um, research group with the RCN as Research Coordination Network. That's an NSF program. Um, anyway, if you go to that website, you can read all about this challenge, and they've got some specific data sets that are laid out there. Um, if you want to sort of play along with the challenge, you're welcome to do that, but we don't expect that you're actually gonna formally submit something to the challenge itself. It would just give you an idea of something that you might be able to do if you're looking for kind of some direction, let's say for your project. And um, Eli pointed out that they have three data sets in particular, um, aquatic ecosystems, tick abundance and beetle abundance that would be really appropriate for this class. Um, I also, just found out this morning that um, Daniel Schindler, who's a professor in the School of Aquatic and Fisheries Sciences, his mother-in-law is a retired professor from the University of Alberta. And she's involved with a large monitoring group in the upper Columbia River Basin. And Suzanne is a wetlands ecologist and she has a data set from 39 different wetlands where they have daily measurements of water level and some other input things. And she's really interested in getting some help analyzing those data. And she's kind of curious if she, if we could come up with a way of classifying wetlands based on sort of the shape of their hydrograph. So if you're interested in wetlands um, and you're struggling for some ideas, just let me know and we can definitely put you in touch with those data and that group of people as well. Okay, so now I'm gonna jump over to, oops, this is a little big some of the course topics, just to sort of give you an idea of what this is. And this is the syllabus tab on the website. Um, so today, uh, after we get done with this bit of an overview, we're gonna talk a little bit about 
sort of the properties of time series. We all kind of have to get on the same page here. There's a bunch of lingo that we want to kind of introduce you to and uh, start to get around. And we'll introduce this concept of time series decomposition. And then on Thursday, we're going to talk about things like covariance and correlation, autocorrelation, autocovariance, cross-correlation, and then we'll start to just introduce this idea of time series models. Then next week, we'll start getting really heavily into some ARIMA type ARMA models. Uh, and then Eli's going to take over and she's going to talk about some forecasting models. And then we'll get into the really fun stuff, at least from our perspective, and that's state space models. And you're going to see some of this. Um, we're going to talk about dynamic factor analysis, which is kind of like PCA for time series. We're going to talk about dynamic linear models and regression with autocorrelated errors. Then Eric's going to take us on some Bayesian adventures and show us how to do some of this in a Bayesian context. And then as the class kind of concludes, we'll start to fill in some of the cracks and other things that we've done or sort of kind of passed over. But in general, it's not until we get down here to nearly the end of the course where we're going to talk about what's called the frequency domain idea. So if people have heard of things like Fourier or wavelets or that sort of thing. That is not the emphasis of this course. Um, there are other places that you can find that information, but that in and of itself would probably be an entire quarter long course as well. So that's kind of a challenge when you only have 10 weeks to communicate all this information. You have to sort of pick and choose and figure out um, what we're going to go with. So moving forward, if you haven't seen already, here's your lecture pages. Um, you, you're going to have over here are the HTML links are the actual slide decks or the PDF form. For those of you who are familiar with Markdown, there's the Markdown code that generated the content. And then over here is sort of background and reading information for you. There's nothing in this class that you have to buy. There's, all of this stuff will be provided for you. These are either, um, if this is stuff we've written personally or open source textbooks and that sort of thing. And many of them are listed on this page. So like in the syllabus, if it says CM09, that means it's Cowperweight and Metcalf's book from 2009. So anyway, and as you go on, right, this we haven't even updated in a while, but there's a lot of information here. Um, but all of these are available to you. Um, um, hey, Mark. Yes. You want to click on the, the lab book? Because that's kind of like the main. Oh, yeah. Um, Textbook that it's under references. Uh, I think we have this one too, right? Oh, there, yeah, there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay, so here under references, we have um, that's this book, yeah, that's that one, yeah, which you can also get right here. So I'll click over to this. So this is sort of your textbook for the course, which is stuff that we've all written, and you're going to see a lot of this in the labs, and some of this you'll see in lecture as well, but we'll kind of work from this for a lot of the lab sections. Um, and same thing here, you can get all of the bunch of the background information from up here, if you want to see what's behind this book. Um, Okay, so before I sort of move into the kind of introductory material for the class, does anybody have any questions on sort of the mechanics of the course or expectations, that sort of thing? Nope, no one's jumping up. Um, it hasn't given everybody heartburn at, at the moment, so I guess we're okay. Yeah, Eli. Yeah, um, Mark, so could you also, talk about the GitHub. And if you click that post questions up on the top there next to references, that's going to take you to the issues for our repo. Yep. Okay. So talk about posting questions there. Yep. Um, okay. So for those of you who are a little bit familiar with GitHub, um, fantastic. We are going to use the issues feature here for asking questions. Like I said before, you're welcome to just email one of the instructors and ask, but as turns out in most of science, if you have the same question, six other people have it as well. So if you're so willing and you want to submit a, a question over here, um, then you'll have a chance to not only get that question answered, but everybody else will be able to see what the question was and they'll be able to do it. So 
Um, if you're not familiar with GitHub, here, let me, sorry, I gotta move this window a little. Um, these are issues here, so I'll click on this. Okay, so here was something where we had some discussion in class. This is now from several years back um, that people were asking about covariates and DLMs. Okay, and this is me and here's one of the students, Megan, she's a student in SAP still. Um, and so we had this back and forth, right? So you can see what's going on here. And um, in order to post a new one, you go over here's this button that says big green button says new issue. And you can just type it. I, And then right here, you can say, you know, ah. right. And um, you can, there's ways you can paste hyperlinks in here. You can paste code, um, you know, like, and then if you preview that, see now, here's my question. This is actually code, that sort of thing. And then you can say, okay, submit a new issue. So now if we go back to issues, here's a new one right here. And if you post an issue to this, Eli and Eric and I will get a, a message in our inbox that will say, hey, someone's got an issue. And then that means you know, we can go over here and look to see what the question is and raise it. Um, some of you I know took my class last spring and we use this for class as well. So like Amelia and Brielle and um, Logan, I know you're real familiar with this format. So anyway, any have questions about how this works, just ask and we'll be happy to walk you through this again. But it's, it's pretty self-explanatory and it's pretty hard to get yourself in trouble. So, you know, you click on these things, that's not really going to do anything. Uh, okay. Um, Mark, I wanna say one thing, a little more about the labs. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. Uh, I think on the homework tab, we have a template, an R markdown template for, yeah. So we would like you to use uh, R markdown to submit your homework. And if you're not familiar with that, it's really easy and it'll be really good for you because this is what people are using for combining R code with text. Um, and it's really easy to use it within our studio and you can make an html or a, a pdf from that you can just send us the the r markdown and we've given you a template there for that um and then could you go back to the computer labs tab there all right okay so um there are two labs that this year we decided to make them optional so that you don't turn in the homework um, the first one is um, how to do matrix algebra in R. And if you've never done that in R, um, you, it's easy to do, um, but you need to, to go over that because you're going to be doing that in the class. So you don't want the first time you see it to be um, in the lecture when you face it in, in the homework. So you just click on uh, chapter one there and go through that. And then you can go through the problems at the end. The key is posted there. So you can give it a try or you can just, you know, go through and look at the answers. Okay. Okay. So that one's really fast. And then the next one that we decided this year to do as an optional one is this one on writing linear algebra problems in matrix form. So like if you, you did a linear regression in R, what's happening in the background there is that R is setting up your problem with your covariates and your response variable as this matrix um, equation that it's solving. Um, that's happening in the background. You don't see that. And for what you're going to be learning in the class later when we get to working with multivariate time series so that would mean like time series from a bunch of different locations or from a bunch of different species um, when you're faced with data like that you're going to have to put it in matrix form and that 
um, that can be a little painful in the beginning if when you're not used to it. Once you're used to it, you, you don't even think about it really. Um, but but it is um, it can be a little painful. So um, be, in previous years, we had students do a um, uh, a homework on this to really force them to you know get used to working with matrices. But we decided this year that you know that material it's not really practical enough. It's not something you're going to be using later. We'd like the homeworks to be really practical, like you're working with some real data and you're going through you know how to do diagnostics on that, how to ask some questions with that. So that's what we really want the homeworks to be about. So we made this one optional, but um, on the lab this week, I'm going to walk through that um, material with you and show you that. And I'm going to show you, um, we'll walk through the key together. And I'll, you know, just so you get introduced to how to write multivariate problems in matrix form. Super fantastic. And then the real lab's going to start, I mean, the homework is going to start the next week. Yeah. So, yes, those of you who took Quorum 514 with me last spring are going to be able to do those, those two assignments Eli just said. You'll be able to do them in your sleep right? Because it's basically design matrices and that sort of thing. So anyway, um, but yes, as Eli says, that's, it's an important part of this course. Early on, you won't see much of that, but definitely as we start getting into any of the multivariate problems, you're just going to immediately be seeing vectors and matrices. So don't let that scare you off. And again, I want to emphasize that this is a, a learning community here. So we're not trying to, you know, exclude anyone. So if you have questions, you have problems, ask a lab mate, ask one of us, ask your next door neighbor when you're out getting the mail, you know, whatever the case may be. But yeah, we wanna make sure that everybody is kind of up to speed and able to play along here. Um, okay, Eli or Eric, was there anything else you wanted to touch on? No? I think that all sounds great. I would just reemphasize what Mark said that, um, you know, please, please ask if any of this is unfamiliar or if you're not, used to using GitHub or Markdown and you want extra help with that, um, uh, definitely reach out and um, and we're happy to chat whenever. Yep. Um, I, uh, for the class I did last spring, I put together a, a primer for the first lab we did on using Markdown because same thing, every all the students there had to submit their assignments in Markdown. So I will share that link with the class. And if you want, there's tons of this stuff online. If you just Google R Markdown, the problem is you're going to get too much information and it'll be a little bit tricky to sort through it. So yeah, we can give you a couple of cheat sheets that'll help you with that aspect. Um, yeah, I guess the other thing I would, I would emphasize too is that I think that, um, you know, even though we're already in only, only in the first lecture, um, it's really worth thinking about kind of what, what data you have or, you know, I mean, we, we want to we generate assignments that are you know, interesting, but also things that you can use in, in your real world um, applications to your dissertation work or just other research. So, um, you know, really with the focus on the time series that Mark was talking about, um, if you're unsure maybe of what, what data you might use to do some of these analyses, um, certainly reach out and, and uh, you know, do that in the next couple of weeks so we can start thinking with you about what the options are, what your interests are, and what data sets that we, ha we have that might overlap with those inter interests. Um, yeah, and following up on what Eric just said, um, we will um, early on have a, a deadline for you to tell us what a basic problem you're thinking and what basic data that you're thinking about um, using. You won't have to show us the data, have it all like completely set out or anything like that, but um, just to give us an idea and so that we can also help you out if maybe you're going down a direction that's going to be really difficult for you. Yeah, the uh, I think the other important thing is because of the way a lot of courses like this work. Um, I, for any of you who took Julian Olden's multivariate class last fall, I think it's the same way, right? You have to kind of start by crawling, and then we'll walk, and then we'll run. And the problem is that it's the running stuff at the end that all of you are really going to want to use. So you're going to there may be this kind of sense of kind of 
anxiety, like I'm not there yet, this project, I'm looking at the calendar, I can see when this is due, but the, the, the tools you have in hand really build so that when we kind of get to that point, it's just gonna click for you and you'd be like, oh, wow, I've got my data lined up. This is, I'm, I'm good to go here. And it really won't be too onerous on you at that point, at least that's our intention. So I can appreciate you're thinking about, wow, 60% of my grade is this project and it's so amorphous and I don't, anyway, it will start to become much more clear as we move on. Um, okay, so let's see, let's jump back over here and get this out of the way. And let's talk a little bit about introduction uh, to time series analysis. Sorry, I have to move this. Okay, so um, topics for this little bit of lecture here are, we're gonna talk about, well, what is a time series? That's what this class is about. And this is a bunch of lingo. Everyone hears that catchphrase every word. We're gonna talk about ways to classify time series talk about trends in time series and seasonality. And then we're gonna introduce this concept of classical decomposition because that's really at the root of sort of all time series problems. Okay, so what is a time series? Well, it's really just this simple. It is simply a set of observations taken sequentially in time, okay? That easy. Um, oftentimes you'll see time series represented as a set using these kind of curly brace notations. So for example, here's a time series of length six with several integers. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Here's an example of an actual real time series, right? So here's the concentration of CO2 at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And going back from the late fifties all the way up to present. And you can see that there's some fairly remarkable aspects to this time series, most of which we're gonna discuss a little bit today and then moving forward in this class. But in the future, you'll see a time series like this. And in the back of your mind, you go, oh, I know exactly how I deal with that. Um, so there you go. Um, so how do we classify time series? Well, usually we have some sort of index that we talked about these being just observations that are collected sequentially in time. Well, what do I mean by time here? Well, one possibility is that it's a real interval. It's like you've got a stopwatch, right? And this thing's going out to ten hundredths of a second. And you started it and it was at 1.1 second and you clicked it again, and it was at 2.5. And over the course of that, you had an EEG machine that was measuring electrical output from your heart. Okay, that would be one way. That is actually fairly unusual, especially in ecological data. And in fact, we're not really going to deal with any real valued time indices in this class. Um, instead, we're going to be dealing with discrete time, as we call it. So these are intervals that may be inter in equally spaced. So it might be we started at day one, then we had day two, then we had day three, four, five, et cetera. Um, they might be equally spaced in time in theory but maybe you missed a value. So right here, right, we had one, two, oops, we missed three because your tech overslept, but then we got four, five, and six. The other case is it might be that they're unequally spaced. So this is like total um, opportunistic sampling. We were able to get out there on day two, three, four. It's too windy on day five. Then there was a forest fire on day seven and eight, and then we got back there at nine. So the time series that we're gonna deal with in this class are all going to be indexed where the T here is some sort of integer. We're not gonna deal with real valued time series, which actually has a lot of advantages moving forward. Another way we classify time series is by the underlying process, basically what generated the data. So one possibility is that's discrete. So an example might be the total number of fish caught per trawl, 113. 217, 655, that sort of thing. Um, other values might be continuous, things like salinity or temperature, right? We can measure these out to many decimal places, that sort of thing. Um, they could also be uh, classified by the number of values recorded, right? So in one case, we have univariate data. This is what we'll talk about early in the class. So this might be the total number of fish caught. But as we move on, we're gonna start talking about multivariate time series. So this might be the number of each species of fish caught in a trawl. 
Um, they could also be classified by the type of values recorded. So they could be integers, right? The number of fish caught in a five minute trawl, 2413. Rational, here's the fraction of unclipped fish in a sample. Real, something like mass or length, temperature, those sort of things, 10.2.1, you know, this type of thing. And then a real oddball that we're not really going to address in this class, save for one lecture toward the end of the quarter, are com complex numbers. So time series are not really unlike any other data that you might imagine. It's just that they have this time index. We always see this little subscripted T down there to indicate that this was collected at some time. And as we move on, we might talk about time and location or something like species and location, those sort of things. Okay, um, we're gonna focus on integers and real values for the most part in discrete time. So you'll see a lot of notations where we're gonna talk about univariate time series and we'll call this a scalar. And we tend to use scripted characters, lowercase italics for scalars. And then when we start talking about multivariate time series, you'll see things like a vector. So here we have species one, species two, all the way up to the nth species, but they're still indexed at some time. And as we move on, you're gonna see a lot of this as well. And that's why Eli was making the point that it's really important that you have a, a pretty good understanding of the way vectors and matrices work. Okay, time series objects in R. We are going to use R extensively in this class. Um, hopefully all of you are reasonably familiar with R, um, you're comfortable with it. Uh, time series objects in R have a special designation. They are a TS object. And you can create a time series object in R using this function TS. And it has several arguments, which we'll go through here in a moment. So, excuse me, the first argument are the data. So this is what you want to create a time series object from. And that should either be a vector if it's a univariate time series or a matrix or a data frame if it's multivariate. Then you need to tell it when those time series begin and end. So if it were a year, you might say 1978 and the begin and then in the end is 2020, for instance. Um, if you have monthly time series, you, you, you pass it a vector, which is the first object is the year then the second object is the month. So this might be 2000 and this could be three for March. Then the next thing you need is the frequency. And this is a little bit confusing sometimes because this is the frequency is the number of observations per unit time. So this part is implicit in there because when they say for frequency, these are actual whole numbers, they're not fractions. And most people think about frequencies as a, a fraction, right? So for annual series, the frequency is one. And for monthly series, the frequency is 12. If they were hourly, it'd be 24. If it were quarters of a year, it'd be four, that sort of thing. Um, alternatively, you can replace that frequency argument with a delta t argument and this is the fraction of the sampling period so this is more what i think of as kind of frequency so again for a year it's just one but for month it would be one twelfth okay if it were in hours it would be one over 24 that sort of thing but the nice thing about this is once you've assigned a variable to a time series object r has a bunch of really nice built-in functions that will work on this um, so here's an example. If you want to do this, play along at home, you're welcome to do that. So here I just created a data set, a vector of 30 random normal deviates. And I said, let's create a time series that begins in 1991, ends in 2020, and they're yearly data. So I gave it a frequency of one. In this case over here, I said, well, now let's generate some monthly data. So now I need 30 years, 12 months per year. So again, this is just white noise, a random deviate. And here I'm telling it start in January of 1991 and in December of 2020, 
And there the frequency is 12 because these are monthly data. So if you had dat year or dat month assigned to these objects, and then you, like I said, there's some functions that we're gonna learn in our, that are smart enough to kind of peek under the hood and know, oh, that's a time series object. I know just what to do with it. Now that said, as the course progresses, we will move away from time series objects in R and we will just treat things as like vectors or matrices, that sort of thing. And we will get away from this as an object, but early on we'll use these. And this is a good thing for you just to know in the back of your head, um, because like I said, there are some of these built-in functions that work really cleverly with time series objects. Um, one of the best, especially for exploratory problems is plot dot TS. And it turns out that if you pass this a TS object and you left this off and you just said plot a TS object, R is smart enough to look inside here and see that as a time series object. Okay, so if you plot here, I did plot.ts on that yearly data frame we made a year ago. And immediately it looks inside there and it knew that it started in 1990, it ended in 2020 and it labels this as time. And by default, it just gives this the value of what it is. But just like any other R plot, you can change this information, right? You could give it a better Y label, you could change the color, move the axes around, change the line weight, right? So here's a case now where this is X of T measured from every year from 1990 to 2020. But from an exploratory perspective, this is pretty nice because you could just scrape something off the web, for instance, create a time series object, say plot.ts, and you get a really nice plot of it right away without having to do any fancy stuff. Okay, so um, now we're gonna move into just kind of the introductory idea of time series analysis. But before I do that, I wanna just check in with everyone and see if there are any questions on what we've talked about now, just sort of this concept of time series. I have a question about that um, TS object. How would that work if you had missing values? That is a great question, Jessica. So it is, so um, does everybody know that in R, let me just back up here. Uh, you, you code missing values with capital N, capital A, right? So if this vector, and you could do this at home, or when we're done here, I can, I'll open up in our browser if you want, replace one of the elements in dat1 with an NA. And it won't care at all. It will just see, oh, okay, you missed that sampling because your tech overslept, right? And then when you get to this, you'd see that actually there's a gap. It would just skip like this value, right? There would be this point, there'd be no lines here, and then it would just start over here. So yeah, great question, Jessica. It's, it's smart enough to treat those NAs as truly missing values, as long as you have coded them as, you know, NA, not NA in quotes, not N slash A, but the standard R and A for missing value, yep. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, any other questions? And this is a, we can mess around with this in class on Thursday as well in lab session, but it's also something you can just putz around with on your own. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about analysis of time series. Um, in most statistical uh, classes you've taken, you, as we are in this class, are generally concerned with trying to make inference about what's called a population here based on some sort of samples, right? It's pretty rare we have exhaustive samples. We go out into the population, we grab a few people randomly and we ask them their age and their height. And then maybe we look to see how well age predicts height, something like that. So, right, we might go out and we might seine around the edges of a lake catch some fish and use the data we have on those few fish to make inferences about all fish in the lake. Okay, that's generally the way statistics works. Um, in time series analysis, however, we, we run into a little bit of a, a problem here because we could vary the length of time series. So we may be like, well, yeah, we're gonna sample an extra year. Um, but it's usually, impossible to make multiple observations at a single point in time. 
right? It's really hard for me to be here and in Portland right now, right? That's pretty difficult physically. You all may have mastered that, especially in this whole Zoom world. Um, so for example, right, let's take Microsoft stock. It would be essentially impossible for us to observe today's closing price of Microsoft stock more than once. And you might read it off of several different websites, but it would still be just one number you would have of the closing stock, right? So that means kind of our sort of typical way of thinking about time series and statistical inference is gotta be, we have to sort of change our mindset here because a lot of those kind of general ideas that we have aren't gonna be appropriate for a case where we can only have one observation at time. Okay, so let's talk about descriptions of time series. So here is a plot of the number of users connected to the internet through one router in a building. And if you're curious, this, this, ob this time series object is contained in the base installation of R, so you can go and play with this if you want. But before doing any sort of analysis of these data, you might plot them. And you might say, you might be looking sort of for what's going on. Well, at the beginning, maybe this is about midnight and there's hardly anybody online. And then morning comes around and everybody ramps up and then everyone takes a break and then it ramps up and they take a break, right? So here we've got maybe a period of increase, maybe kind of a flat period. Maybe here's a big period of decrease. Here's a period of increase, okay? So we just did a description of that time series that's probably not gonna satisfy your advisor and your committee, right? So you, you're gonna to wanna to do something more formal than that. And we're gonna help you with the tools that you'll need to actually make more formal kind of idea, you know, descriptions of these time series. Okay, so here's a time series of the number of links trapped in Canada from the early 1800s to the early 1900s. And for those of you who've taken a general ecology class, you've probably seen some of these data before, but in this case, right, there's some really peculiar aspects to this time series. I mean, the first thing to notice about this is this is bounded at zero. No such thing as negative counts of links. Okay, so that's one thing we'd wanna pay attention to. All right, we've got, this is a lower bound at zero. Then the other thing here is, there doesn't really seem to be any increasing or decreasing trend in the number of links over time but there are these really bizarre cycles, right? There are very low numbers of links and all of a sudden it goes way up and it comes way down and goes way up. So there's some sort of seasonal aspect here that you'd like to be able to say something about. So again, plotting the time series right away, you get some idea, oh, there's something going on here with links. And it turns out it has to do with their primary prey, snowshoe hare. And in fact, it's actually related to sunspots. So there's a bunch of things that you, this would very quickly take you down many possible roads, but by just, again, plotting the time series and thinking about, oh, what's going on here? Okay, well, we, we're gonna have to deal with the seasonal aspect and we'd have to deal with the fact that these are lower bounded at zero. Okay, so therefore, if we wanna kind of formalize this, then we're gonna start to talk about models and a time series model, what is this? You know, like what is a linear regression model? What is a ANOVA model? These sort of things. Well, a time series model for a set, X of T, is a specification of the joint distribution of a sequence of random variables of which the data you have is thought to be of one realization. So what you can think of, right? Imagine there's a population of things going on out there and you just get to dip your temperature probe in there once. So there might be all kinds of different temperature profiles, but you're only sampling one of those. So by way of kind of an example, here's a joint distribution of a random variable. It happens to be just white noise, right? But the time series you have in hand is but one realization of those. So what you actually have in your possession is that blue line. All that other stuff is going on in the background, but you never saw it. Okay, so what you want to come up with is a, a model that describes what this blue line is doing in more of a formal context than just like, yeah, it went up, it went down. Okay, it looks kind of like a seesaw. Okay, again, that's not really going to satisfy your committee or the journal that you're trying to publish. So how about some simple time series model? Well, this one I just told you was white noise. 
And a white noise model looks like this. It's really simple. It just says the thing in your possession, x of t here, is just drawn from a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a variance of one. Okay, this is probably the most simple time series model ever. But it's kind of boring, but it's a good, pretty good building block. And the idea is that we're going to build on this and become more and more descriptive. We'll add in more and more pieces so that you can say something more formally about that. Um, here's some realizations of a random walk model. And a random walk says, today, you are where you were yesterday, plus some error. So in this case, we started all of these time series here. They started at t equals 1. So at t equals 1, we didn't know what this is. So in general, we just assume this is gone. It's 0. And so we just draw something from here. So this was realizations where all of them started some point here, and then they wandered off into space. And if you think about this model, there doesn't really appear to be any change over time, right? There's generally an upper bound here. There's generally a lower bound there. And you get this kind of just fuzzy caterpillar look. But if you contrast that with this white or this random walk model, it's not really the same, right? They, all of these started out pretty close to one another. But by the end over here, they all diverge. So it's kind of this conical shape. And that's an important aspect of random walks. And we're going to spend a lot of time in this class talking about different forms of random walks. And random walk is a basis for other models. But again, this is a pretty simple model, right? It's linear. In fact, the only parameter in this model is the, is the mean and the variance here. And I already specified those, so you don't even have to estimate them. The idea is that not all time series models have to be super fancy and have all kinds of bells and whistles on them because actually a random walk model here is an amazingly flexible model that would allow you to actually describe lots of different time series. So that's why we'll spend quite a bit of time thinking about random walks and then other forms that are similar to random walks that build upon this. Okay, so um, lastly, we're gonna talk about classical decomposition. And the idea behind classical decomposition is that we want to model our time series, this set of values, as a combination of three things, a trend, some seasonal components, and then some remainder, this error. And the important thing in time series here, when we say trend, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a linear regression trend. Like most of us think if someone says it's a trend, oh, it's increasing. All right, we could have a trend that goes up as well, right? Could be these sort of things. So we're gonna relax kind of this idea of what a trend is, but it's just sort of a general notion, maybe we'll call it. Okay, so we need to get this trend, the first bit, we need a way to subtract what we're gonna call a signal from the noise. And one of the most common ways of doing this is what are called linear filters. And a linear filter can really just be thought of as a smoother. We're just gonna try to wig, get rid of some of that kind of wiggle and try to extract what's really going on there. So think back to that time series I showed at the very beginning of the Mauna Loa CO2, right? It generally had an increase, then there's a seesaw pattern around it. And we're trying to get what that general increase is out of it. So in general, Linear filters take a form of a summation. So the trend at time t, your estimate of, is going to be a summation from minus, in theory, infinity. You can go way back in time, and then you go way forward in time. And you're just weighting these. That's what this uh, lambda is here, by the values that are either plus or minus that value. And this will make a lot more sense here in a moment. So for example, a moving average, many of you have probably thought of moving averages. This is something like Excel will even do a moving average plot for you right out of the box. And a moving average says, go from an index minus A up to A. And then this, the weight here is one over two times A plus one times these values. And this is gonna make a lot more sense in a moment. So let's say we set A equal to one. Well, that says go from minus one, zero to one. 
and take one over two a plus one. Well, one over two plus one is one third. And then it just says take t plus i. Well, that's minus one. So there's t minus one. It says t plus i. Well, that's zero. So that's just t. And then t is one. So here's a moving average thing where you've set a equal to one. And so basically, that's going to say at time t, your estimate of the trend is an average of the value beforehand, the value now, and the value tomorrow. Okay, so as A increases now, the estimated trend is gonna become more smooth because we're gonna extend the range over which we're gonna average those values. Okay, so here's an example of, of how that works. So here's monthly airline passengers from 1940 to 1960. This is another one that comes right out of the base R installation. And you know, it starts down here in the mid 40s, it's pretty low. And by mid 60s, it's pretty high, but there's also kind of this weird pattern going on in here. But the first step is we wanna figure out what's the overall trend in here. So let's pass a linear filter through there. So here's one where I set A equal to one so that that lambda is one third. Okay, so now you can see it's generally capturing these kind of highs and lows, but it's not getting them perfect. Okay, and now we make that filter a little longer. So now we've set A goes up to four and lambda is down to one ninth. And you can see that this is becoming smoother, right? So here we are now, we've got A at 13 and lambda is at one. So now this kind of deep red line here is nearly flat, right? It has just a little bit of wiggle to it, but it's doing this. So as you crank up A, you're extending the length out and you're really smoothing out, you're dampening these highs and lows. The other thing to notice here though, as you're doing this, right, you're cutting off ends of the time series, right? Because you have to go back in time and you have to go forward in time. So by the time you're at A equals 13, you've lost all these values here and you've also lost them back here. So that's a really simple way of extracting a trend from a time series or just these linear filters. Okay, the next aspect we want is a seasonal component. So if we know what the, the data are and we have an estimate of our trend, if we subtract the trend from the data, we should get a seasonal bit. Okay, so let's do this. So here I used a linear filter where A was three and Lambda was one ninth. Extracted that, that was the um, orange line in that previous plot. And subtracting those yields this seasonal effect right here. So it's centered around zero. And you've, you've got this kind of weird seesaw pattern, which tends to be growing in amplitude as time goes on. And that is actually causing us a little bit of grief. We'd really rather have the seasonal component be fixed for a given month, let's say. So what we can do is kind of smooth that out because the issue here is that when we estimated the seasonal component by just subtracting the trend from the real data, we, we forgot about this little error bit in there, right? It's S hat here really contains the seasonal bit plus the errors. So now we wanna get rid of this error part because we just want the seasonal part. So to do that, here we estimate the mean seasonal effect. So these are monthly data. So what we could do is estimate a, a seasonal component for January by averaging all of the Januaries. Then we could figure out what it was for February by averaging all the Februaries and do that up for every month through December. Okay, and that would give us the average seasonal component for January, February, March, et cetera, et cetera. And then you just repeat that sequence over and over again. So here's the way that looks. So if we took this, we take our data, we subtract out the trend. Now we have season plus error. And if we average across all of those dates, now we've, got, we've gotten rid of that error bit and here's just our seasonal effect. So there are, this is a, a basically a time series of 12 values that just repeats itself over and over and over, right? It's January, February, March, April, May. And looking at this, honestly, this might just be a nuisance for us, but it's a way of getting, you know, trying to extract that signal. Now, I have no idea why airline 
passenger behavior looks like this, right? Some of this is probably holidays and that sort of thing, but why the really bizarre peak? You'd think maybe it'd go up in December when people travel for the winter holidays, and then maybe it goes up in the summer when people take their summer holidays. But anyway, nevertheless, this is what it looks like. Once you've got the trend component and your seasonal component, then getting the errors just amounts to subtraction, right? You take the data minus your average, your trend minus the season, and you get the remainders. And that's what it looks like for these data. And we'll talk a lot in this class about diagnostics and assumptions of models and that sort of things, just as you would have in any other modeling class, like when you took linear models class, right? You probably worked on things like, are your residuals uh, independent? Are they identically distributed? Do they have no autocorrelation? This sort of thing. Um, and for those of you who can remember that far back these days, I can't. Um, but this time series of residuals actually looks pretty bad from a model perspective, right? It, these don't look like that fuzzy white caterpillar that I showed earlier in class. There's definitely some structure left here in these residuals. So that kind of really simple model we fit to these data is not great because there's still some remaining, clearly there's something left over in what we're just considering noise here. So if we were doing this more rigorously, we'd pause here and say, okay, I think we need a slightly more complicated model to try to address this remainder bit. Okay. Let's try that same thing now, but let's uh, make some really simple assumptions. So we're going to log transform those data because there were counts. So they're bounded at zero, right? You can't have negative numbers of passengers on an airplane. And we're going to just assume there's a linear trend in the data. So we won't use a linear filter. Okay, so now here are the log transform data. And these look a lot better. There's still kind of this trend that looks pretty linear. Um, but now that sort of seasonal bit doesn't grow in amplitude, right? This total displacement here is pretty close to this total displacement. Okay, so in there we just fit a linear line through there. That's just a basically a linear regression problem. Subtract that, we get our seasonal effect with error. Then we take the means of the Januarys, the means of the Februarys, et cetera, repeat that. So now we have our mean seasonal effect. And now we have our remainder. And this remainder, these residuals, if you will, look a lot better than they did with the non-transformed data and a non-linear trend, but they're still not great. But that's OK, because we have other methods that you're going to learn in this class to deal with these types of data. So. This was just really by way of example, sort of the idea that you're going to work with throughout this class. You're going to have some data set and you're going to try to explain as much of it, the structure in that data set with either things like trend, seasonal component. Later on, we'll learn things like adding in covariates, right? Like if you wanted to know, you're trying to measure the, um, the mass of fish and you're trying to estimate that, knowing something about their length may help you explain the mass, right? So you could add that sort of thing. And you're looking at growth of a cold blooded organism. If you knew something about temperature, that might help tell you a lot. So we're going to start, we'll start by crawling then we'll start walking and then we'll start doing the fun stuff. We'll add in a lot more of this. But the idea is that ultimately in general, we'd like this to look a lot more like white noise when we're done. That's not always possible, but that's kind of our hope and our, what we strive for. Okay, so just to summarize, um, today basically what we were talking about is characteristics of time series, the way we might describe them if we were at a cocktail party chatting with our friends. God, I wish we could do that. Um, but, right, and then we talked about this idea of classical decomposition. And we started with a really simple example but it's just to motivate what's going on. But that's, we are going to essentially take this idea of classical decomposition forward in the class. And we'll be, the idea is to try to describe what's going on in your data with sort of structural components. So that it's not just, yeah, it's a mess, too bad, so sad, right? I mean, that's not very fulfilling. So that is um, all we have for today.
on um, Thursday, we'll start diving into sort of the properties of time series a little bit deeper in ways that we can describe time series and tools that we'll use to help us do some of this modeling exercise that we're going to be working on. So we um, have a few minutes left. If there are any questions, happy to entertain those. Whether it's with respect to the stuff we just talked about or course logistics or how you're feeling today, any of those things are game as far as I'm concerned.